three brand new locomotives coupled together, stretched almost the length of a football field. Fresh yellow paint catching the Nebraska sun, not a scratch on them, factory smell still in the cabs. Press photographers lined up along the platform, railroad executives in suits watching from a safe distance. The most powerful diesel locomotive ever built in America, about to prove itself on its maiden run westbound. The engineer opens the throttle, the units start pulling. Somewhere around the first stage of electrical transition, according to crew and shop floor accounts, the electrical cabinet doors on all three units blew open at once. Flames and sparks were seen coming from the lower panels, and grass along the right of way caught fire. The whole consist grinds to a halt, and a switcher has to be sent out to tow the wreckage back to the yard. That was the Alco Century 855, three units built. The entire three-unit set suffered a catastrophic electrical failure on its first run, and within eight years, every single one was cut up for scrap. To understand how something like this happens, you have to understand Union Pacific in the early 60s. This was a railroad that had always been obsessed with raw power, Big Boy, Challenger, the gas turbines that burned bunker fuel and sounded like jet engines crossing Wyoming. When other railroads were content with four-unit locomotive consists, Union Pacific was stringing together massive power combinations and sending them over the Continental Divide. They wanted fewer locomotives pulling longer trains, and they were absolutely willing to experiment to get there. By 1962, the turbines were getting expensive to maintain, and fuel costs were climbing. Union Pacific's chief mechanical officer David Newhart came up with a plan. He wanted a single diesel unit that could produce 5,000 horsepower or more. String three of them together, and you would have 15,000 horsepower, replacing 10 older units. Lower maintenance costs, fewer crew changes, simpler operations. Union Pacific sent specifications to all three major locomotive builders. General Electric responded with the U-50. Electromotive came back with the DD35, and Alco, the American locomotive company, offered the Century 855 with a rating of 5,500 horsepower per unit, the most powerful of the bunch. On paper, Alco had the edge. In reality, they were a company running out of time. The C855 was essentially two locomotives welded onto one frame. Each unit carried a pair of 16-cylinder Alco 251C diesel engines, the same proven power plants used in their smaller century models. Two engines meant two generators, eight traction motors, and 5,500 horsepower available at the rail. The unit weighed over 550,000 pounds. It was 86 feet long per unit. When all three were coupled as an ABA set, the consist stretched nearly the length of a football field. The trucks were taken from retired Union Pacific gas turbines, reconditioned, and shipped to Alco's Schenectady plant. Here's where the problem started. Alco, under severe financial pressure at the time, was aggressively cutting costs wherever possible. The company had been losing market share to EMD for over a decade, and their finances were getting tight. One of the cost-saving measures they implemented was using aluminum wiring instead of copper throughout the electrical system. Aluminum is lighter and cheaper than copper. It also expands and contracts more with temperature changes, and the connections tend to loosen over time. In a locomotive running hard through the Rockies, that becomes a serious issue. The aluminum wiring was reported by maintenance crews to overheat an arc under heavy loads. The second problem was more immediate. According to shop floor accounts that circulated afterward, the traction motor shunting contactors had been miswired during assembly. When the locomotive went through its first electrical transition under load, the field shunts got connected directly across the main generator output. The result was a massive short circuit that blew the cabinet doors clean off and started fires in all three units at once. After the first day disaster, Alco engineers were brought in to rewire the contactors properly. The units went back into service, based out of North Platte, Nebraska, assigned to the general freight pool running over Sherman Hill toward Ogden, Utah. Sherman Hill was one of the toughest assignments in North America. 
high altitude, extreme temperature swings, heavy grades, and brutal winter conditions. The kind of environment that exposes every weakness in a locomotive design. The C855 started having problems almost immediately. Crews described them as rough riding and uncomfortable. The twin engines produced enormous amounts of heat, and the cooling system struggled to keep up. Units were repeatedly reported to shut down due to overheating. In cold weather, systems would freeze up and refuse to start. The aluminum wiring continued to cause trouble. Connections would work loose, leading to intermittent failures and occasional arcing. Maintenance crews found the units difficult to work on, partly because Alco had so few other locomotives on the UP roster. Parts were hard to source, and shop forces were not familiar with the quirks of Alco electrical systems. One engineer who worked at the Ogden Roundhouse in 1968 later put it this way, if all three C855 fives were actually working and you could get them connected, they could pull the whole town up the Wasatch. The problem was the conditional. Getting all three units operational at the same time was rare. Union Pacific appears to have avoided running them as a full ABA set again after that first day. The three units were usually kept together in some combination, but the railroad had clearly lost confidence in the design. While the C855 struggled, the competition was doing better. GE's U50 had its own problems, but Union Pacific ordered 23 of them and kept them running until 1977. EMD's DD35 proved more reliable still, lasting into the early 1980s, and the DDA40X Centennial, which came later with 6,600 horsepower, ended up rolling more than 2 million miles in revenue service. Alco got no follow-up orders. The three C855s remained orphans on a railroad that had essentially written them off as a failed experiment. When they worked, crews admitted they pulled well. The tractive effort was genuine, but they were widely described by crews and shop forces as spending far more time in maintenance than in revenue service. By 1970, all three units had been pulled from active service and placed in storage. Alco itself had stopped building locomotives entirely in January 1969, closing the Schenectady plant after 121 years of continuous production. Employment at that plant had dropped from 10,000 workers in 1951 to barely over a thousand by the end. The company that built Big Boy could not survive the diesel transition. The C855 unit sat in storage for two years before Union Pacific finally cut them up in February 1972. That was less than eight years from delivery to the scrapyard. No museum wanted them. No short line picked them up for parts. All three simply disappeared. The aluminum wiring issue wasn't unique to Alco. GE's U50C, which came later, had the same cost-cutting measure and the same fire problems. The industry eventually learned that lesson. But for Alco, the C855 was one more confirmation of what railroads had already started believing about their reliability. Union Pacific kept buying experimental high-horsepower locomotives for another decade. They just stopped buying them from Alco. The company that once dominated American railroading had become a cautionary tale about what happens when you ship a product before it's ready, cut corners to save money, and hope the customer won't notice. The C855 was not the sole reason Alco collapsed, but it became one of the most visible symbols of the company's decline. The company had been bleeding market share for years, and EMD had already captured 88% of the American locomotive market, but this locomotive was the last big gamble they made, and it failed in the most public way possible. Three locomotives, electrical fires, one maiden voyage, and a switcher sent out to bring the wreckage home before the paint had even gotten dirty.